Good evening. I'd like to get the show on the road, if you don't mind, relatively on time so everyone can get out and do whatever it is they would like to do on this beautiful evening. As president of the Manchester Historic Association Board of Trustees, it is my honor to welcome you to our 30th Annual Historic Preservation Awards. I'm pleased to say even through COVID, we haven't missed a year in honoring those who preserve the beautiful buildings, neighborhoods, traditions, and other historic resources in our Queen City. I think they're all sitting on this part of the uh, room tonight. During this period of time, more than 230 recipients have been recognized for a wide variety of preservation efforts in 40 different categories, and we'll obviously be adding to that list tonight. Unfortunately, speaking of COVID, many of you may have already noticed we are without our Master of Ceremonies, Ed Bruder, who unfortunately encountered COVID earlier this week. We are all pinch hitting and running the show without him, although he did a good portion of the work you're going to see tonight, and we know it won't be quite the same without his wonderful radio personality and voice. The MHA has had a few changes this year, including, as many of you probably know, John Clayton stepping down as executive director after a seven-year tenure. We are very appreciative of John's contributions during that time and for the level of recognition he has helped the MHA gain. I have it on good authority that John is enjoying well-deserved time at the beach this summer. And actually, I think I saw earlier, he's in Florida right now and also enjoying time with his family. Jeff Barraclough, our former director of operations, has assumed the role of executive director and is now taking the lead without skipping a beat. And we were fortunate, fortunate to hire a few new employees to complement our small but mighty staff who continue to amaze me with the feats they perform every day, including throwing this together tonight. I'm honored to work with such a great team. I do wanna thank you all for being here tonight. I know there are several other events taking place, and so the fact that you chose to be here with us tonight is awesome. You support us in our mission to collect, preserve, and share the history of Manchester, and that is so vital and very much appreciated. In a short bit, you will hear more about what we've accomplished this past year and how your support positively impacts our community. I also want to extend congratulations to all of our award honorees tonight and the Century Club recipient as well. Please take, just let me take a moment to introduce our newest trustees and ask if they would please stand. Those joining our board in 2022 are Sue Gelinas. Thank you, Sue. And Christopher Messier. And where's Christopher? I see him in the back of the room. I think they're wondering what they got themselves into. And would the rest of our board please stand? I think we have almost every board member here tonight, so thank you all. Awesome, thank you. Thank you for sharing your talents, energy, and passion with the MHA. You are a great board, and I really enjoy working with each and every one of you. You make my job very much easier. And a big thank you to our co-chairs for this event tonight, Selma Nakashhoff and Gail York, and the entire committee. Thank you. With Gail and Selma leading the charge, this group has gone above and beyond in their efforts to make this an extra special evening for our honorees and guests. And last but certainly not least, it's my pleasure to introduce our honorary chair, Mike Skelton. I'm sure most, if not all of you, know Mike, and he was the president of, and CEO of the Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce, and now serving in Concord as the Manchester, as the president and CEO of the Business and Industry Association of New Hampshire. I can't tell you how grateful we are for Mike's willingness to take on this role for us, um, especially since he's taken on a new role of his own. The dedication in making this event a success and just going with the flow tonight, Mike, I can't tell you. So with navigating the program without Ed, please welcome Ma Mike Skelton. Thank you so much. Thank you, Colleen. Good evening, everyone. Really excited uh, to be here with you and uh, truly honored and humbled to be asked uh, to serve as uh, honorary chair and uh, also learned that can't say no to, to Gail and Selma uh, when they call um, and uh, echo the sentiments uh, that Colleen just mentioned of how great it was to work with them and the team. 
And I did want to start by giving thanks to those uh, whose hard work and dedication uh, made this event possible. Uh, Jeff and his team at MHA, the Board of Trustees, the Event Planning Committee, and again, the dynamic and tireless behind the scenes event planning co-chairs, Gail York and Selma Nakash Hoff. Thank you so much for your work. Let's give them a round of applause again. So we have a, a busy program uh, this evening, but I just wanted to share mm -hmm. a few words on why the work of the Manchester H Historic Association is so important and deserving of our uh, support. Um, as Colleen mentioned, I just uh, wrapped up a eight year uh, tenure as uh, President and CEO of the Greater Manchester Chamber and was on staff at the Manchester Chamber for five years uh, before that. So the majority of my professional career was tied to that institution, one that is very near and dear to me and uh, also a Manchester native, uh, went to uh, college at St. Anselm College, um, so uh, have deep family roots in Manchester. Um, so it was a very important part of uh, my life and during my time as, as CEO of the city's Chamber of Commerce, you know, I got to see and experience firsthand the ingredients of what makes a resilient, growing and thriving uh, community. And not only did I get to observe this in my experience in Manchester, because Manchester has those attributes, um, but also learning from my chamber colleagues across the country, um, other chamber CEOs and the communities that they represent. And without fail, the strongest, most dynamic, most resilient communities were the ones that had forged an identity by connecting their past with their future. And Manchester is truly uh, unique and special in this regard as having one of the most compelling uh, stories to tell. A city that has withstood nearly every challenge possible, economic downturns, floods, mill closure, and it's reinvented itself at every turn, no matter what those challenges have been. And where other communities and mill towns uh, across the country and in the Northeast have faded, Manchester has famously earned the nickname, the city that wouldn't die. And living and working in this community can be easy to take this unique, unique identity and history of ours uh, for granted. Uh, during my time at the chamber, and I know this practice continues today, uh, and there's some chamber staff here tonight who can uh, uh, confirm this, that our go-to recommendation to out-of-state visitors stopping by the office or calling us was to visit the Manchester, the Milliard Museum. And we knew that if we have visitors to Manchester for only one day or one afternoon or a couple hours and we can expose them to this unique history and story of our city, it would positively shape their perception of Manchester and enhance their experience. And I can't tell you how many times over my 13 year career at the chamber how many visitors would reach back out to us afterwards and thank us and share with us how much they enjoyed their time in Manchester and the appreciation of the city's history and how what they thought would be a stop, a stopover, a place to get lunch on their way to some other part of their vacation in New England um, became a highlight and something that they shared with others and they were eager to celebrate and learn more about. And without the Manchester Historic Association serving as a steward and a guardian of our community's history, these types of experiences are not possible. Um, this stewardship of our history and story uh, not only engages visitors and new residents in understanding why our community is specially unique, it also provides inspiration, ideas, and the courage for our citizens, for our community, to keep moving forward and keep re reinventing itself and trying new things. And I think you can see that in the exciting new projects and developments underway or completed over the last few years. You can see that in the honorees and the awards that are given at this, at this event over the years. You know, whether it's new business activity and uh, development in the Mill Yard or the Gaslight District or the Elm Street Corridor or things like the Army Initiative working towards bringing a new type of manufacturing back to the Mill Yard, the biofabrication of skin and tissue and organs. All of these are signs of growth and progress that are built on our historic identity of resiliency and reinvention. 
I, I really strongly believe that communities are only as strong as their institutions. Their civic institutions, their nonprofit, religious, cultural institutions. And Manchester is very fortunate to have so many great institutions uh, serving important missions. Manchester Historic Association is one of our most important institutions because of our unique history and its value to our community. It serves a unique role to preserve and share Manchester's history, a mission that no other institution in our community exists to do, and is essential to our city's health, vibrancy, and vision for the future. So in a few moments, I'm gonna welcome our Executive Director, Jeff, up to the stage to join me to uh, share some remarks recapping the great things the association is doing to fulfill its mission, and following that, there will be an opportunity for all of us to support MHA with a donation. And I would ask you, please consider supporting this wonderful and important institution so that the Manchester Historic Association can continue to preserve and share our hist history while we are all shaping our city's future. Thank you so much. So with that, Jeff, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to the new executive director of the Manchester Historic Association, Jeff Barraclough. Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome to the 30th Annual Historic Preservation Awards. For 30 years now, through this awards program, the Manchester Historic Association has been recognizing and supporting the efforts of over 200 individuals, businesses, and organizations that have made significant contributions to the preservation of buildings, neighborhoods, traditions, and other historic resources in our city. This includes city landmarks like the Pulaski Park, the Archie Sullivan Building, the Ash Street School, the Jefferson Mill, as well as individuals who have contributed to Manchester's historic preservation, including Betty Lassard, George Naum, John Jordan, Silvio Dupree, and Ray Wazorek, among many others. And we are excited to be recognizing tonight's honorees with names whose names and projects will be added to that list. But beyond just recognition, this program has served as a community builder in Manchester, and we hope has encouraged preservation efforts by demonstrating that historic preservation is possible whether you are a homeowner, a small business, a nonprofit, or a department within the city, and that historic preservation is good for the community. We have several great examples of this that you will hear about tonight. And many great things have happened through this program, both directly and indirectly, and it continues to serve as a positive force in the city. We have some great sponsors who have made this event possible this evening. Thank you to our lead sponsor, RBC Wealth Management, the Belanger Wealth Management Group, for your continued support of both the MHA and this event, and also to our $2,500 level dessert sponsors. They are Brady Sullivan Properties, Eastern Bank, Eversource, Southern New Hampshire University, and St. Mary's Bank. I encourage you all to read through your program book uh, for a complete list of sponsors. We thank all of our supporters and sponsors and the many individuals who bought tickets to support this event this evening. Thank you very much. I would also like to acknowledge and thank our trustees and the event committee who have made this event possible this evening, including co-chairs Gail York and Selma Nakash Hoff. They've worked tirelessly to make this event a success. Thank you also to the Historic Preservation Committee who met last year to consider award nominations and choose tonight's honorees. I would like to give a special recognition to our hardworking and dedicated staff here at the, MH, at the Manchester Historic Association. Uh, when I call your name, please stand and wave. We have Christy Ellsworth, our museum educator. Our archivist, Daniel Peters. Our visitor services associate, Beverly Peters. Our maintenance coordinator, Bill Clayton, who is not here tonight. And Mark Mastermarino, our library assistant. And finally, thank you to all of the many volunteers who have helped uh, made this event possible and also just helped make our mission possible in what we do. The Manchester Historic Association's mission 
is to collect, preserve, and share the history of Manchester. So I'd like to take a few moments tonight to share with you ways in which we've been doing that in the last year. On the collect and preserve part of our mission, each year we take in dozens of new donations of historical objects that enhance our collection. Each object we have helps to tell the story of Manchester and its people, and every new item that we accept helps us to expand that story to more completely tell and preserve the city's history. If the object is not on exhibit at the Mill Yard Museum, it is stored in our archives and cared for at our Manchester Research Center on Amherst Street, our headquarters building since 1931, and where dozens of people come each month to research and learn about their family, their property, or other topics of interest. New items that have recently been accepted into the collection include uniforms, records, and badges of the Manchester Police Department, a quilt that was made by workers in the Emiskeg Mills between 1896 and 1924, a bench rescued from Pine Island Park, and the first patient admission log of the Elliott Hospital dating from 1890 through 1902. Sharing Manchester's history is also a key part of our mission, which we carry out in many ways. One way we do this is through school groups. We have had over 1,400 children visit the Milliard Museum this winter and spring, marking the first time since the pandemic that we've been able to welcome school field trips back to the museum to learn about Manchester. It has really been great to have all that energy back in the museum finally. This summer, we also launched a new program focused on women in the mills that was designed for a Girls at Work summer camp program. For seven weeks this summer, girls participating in the Girls at Work camp visited the Milliard Museum and learned about what life was like for the women who worked in the mills, including an activity where they dress an American girl doll like a mill girl with 21 different clothing layers and accessories. We have really enjoyed this partnership with our neighboring nonprofit. Another way that we share Manchester's history through our mission is through our exhibits at the Milliard Museum. Beyond our regular exhibit that chronologically tells the story of both Manchester and the Emiskeg Mills, we have rotating temporary exhibitions that focus on a particular topic or artist. Our current exhibition, up for another month, showcases the sculpture of John Rogers, a talented 19th century artist and successful businessman who got his start as a sculptor while working at the Emiskeg machine shop. Our next exhibit, which will be opening in December, will highlight the works of Frank Kelly, a prominent Manchester photographer in the 1950s through the 1980s. And we share Manchester's history through programs. We offer a number of walking tours, lectures, and other public programs throughout the year. These include our popular actor-led tours in which we partner with the Majestic Theatre, including Manchester's Most Wanted, an event held in March at the Milliard Museum that featured criminals from the Most Wanted list held by the Manchester Police, and a tour with some of Manchester's most notable early citizens held just two weeks ago at Stark Park. We also host concerts, lectures, and popular American Girl Doll tea parties. Without the support of our members, sponsors, and other donors, none of this would be possible. So this is the portion of the program where we reach out and directly uh, solicit your support for the Manchester Historic Association. This is also the portion of the program where I attempt to channel Ed Bruder and uh, do my best to fill uh, his shoes. Um, but as you know, uh, the Manchester Historic Association receives no city, state, or federal funding. So we depend on supporters like you to fulfill our mission to collect, preserve, and share the history of this great community. And, and what a great overview that was. I, I learned a lot about what the Historic Association is up to just from that overview. So, um, Jeff. We, we hope you will consider making a donation tonight to help support the many ways that the MHA helps this community by preserving its history. If you do raise your hand tonight to make a pledge, we will have board members throughout the room who will be handing out little stars. Uh, please keep your hand in the air so they can hand you a star with the corresponding amount, which will enable us to process your pledge most effic efficiently at the end of the program. So to begin, let us start at the $1,000 level. As an example, uh, your donation of $1,000 could help subsidize a new exhibition at the Milliard Museum, such as uh, what you just saw, our current exhibition on the sculpture of John Rogers, or upcoming exhibit 
the photography of Frank Kelly. Would anyone be willing to pledge at the $1,000 level tonight? Don Gardner, thank you so much, Don. Mike Duffy, thank you, Mike. Yes, Doug McAdish, thank you so much, Doug. That's wonderful. Thank you all so much for, for that, that support. So let's move to the next level. With a $500 donation, your pledge could help subsidize a field trip to the Milliard Museum for an entire elementary school class, including both the program fees for the students and the staff time it takes to develop and run the programs. And uh, I'll get us started at the $500 level. We can take that one. And would anyone else like to join me at the $500 level? <laughs> thank you very much. Carol Lawrence, thank you, Thank Carol. you. Thank you very much. You. Staff members come right over, thank you. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Um, I should take a moment here to point out that all of those who have so far made pledges tonight will receive a great gift bag like this one here. Uh, this is filled with some wonderful items, including gift cards to some of your favorite Manchester restaurants, including Cafe Lorraine, the Crown Tavern, the Hanover Street Chop House, and Shoppers Pub and Eatery at Indian Head. Also in the bag is a beautiful pewter ornament celebrating 100 years of the Red Arrow Diner thanks to our friends at the Red Arrow, and also a nice blanket from UNH Manchester. There are several other items as well, in total a value of over $150. And the bag itself is a thank you from our friends at St. Anselm College. So this, those gift bags can be uh, picked up from all of you uh, at the registration table following the end of tonight's program. Uh, but the gift bags will also go to those who pledge at the $250 level. So, who will pledge at that level and walk away with great gift bag? Mr. Drysdale, thank you. <laughs> Ralph Sabor, thank you. June right here in the yes. second row, thank you, June. And Rob, thank you, Rob. Yes, in the back, thank you. Dave, thank you very much. Right over there. Jean, thank you, Jean. Amy, thank you very much. Over there. Gift bags are going quick. <laughs> oh, Mary Lou, thanks, Mary. Thank you for that uh, great result. Well, as Jeff mentioned, the gift bags are available to you at the end of uh, tonight's program. So let's move along to the $100 level now. A gift of $100 will help extend our mobile auto audio tour of the Milliard Museum, which enables history lovers to enjoy the museum on their cell phones or tablets from anywhere in the world. Um, $100 level contribution. Thank you, Preston. Yeah. Hold those hands up, we'll ben, get a trustee over to you. Ben, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Carrie. Roy Peters, thank you, Roy. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. And the final set of stars that our trustees have here tonight is at the $50 level. Would anyone like to pledge $50? Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, as, just as a reminder, uh, you'll notice if you've got a star tonight, they also have a QR code on the back. If you wish, you can scan the code to make a secure payment online. Otherwise, staff will be available at the registration table following tonight's program to assist you with your payment. On behalf of all of our members, thank you so much for your support and generosity. I would now like to introduce our museum educator, Christy Ellsworth, who will be helping with the awards program this evening and presenting this year's Century Club Award. Good evening, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, I am no Ed Bruder, so I would appreciate just a little bit of patience, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, each year, we acknowledge organizations and businesses that have reached the 100-year mark. In 2022, we recognize an institution on Manchester's restaurant scene. Opened in 1922 by David and Mabel Lamontagne, the company has expanded, retracted, and changed hands over time but it's still a must-stop landmark during the New Hampshire's presidential primary season. Tonight, we recognize the Red Arrow Diner with a Century Club Award. Accepting the award is co-owner Carol Lawrence. Thank you so much. Many thanks to the Historic Association for this great honor. When I became the fifth owner of the iconic Red Arrow Diner in 1987, I never could have imagined I would someday accept a Century Club Award for the diner's 100 years of service to the community. I am proud to accept this award on behalf of my co-owners, my dad, George Lawrence, and Amanda Whibby, who are, who are here with me tonight, and all of our employees at all at, at our Manchester, Concord, Londonderry, and Nashville locations. We are grateful to the owners and their families who came before us, founder David Lamontagne and Levi Latown, who made the Red Arrow Diner a Manchester staple. While the Red Arrow Diner is known for its home-cooked comfort food and baked goods, American chop suey or coconut cream pie, anyone? <laughs> and for being a must-stop location for politicians each and every election cycle, I truly feel the Red Arrow Diner is most special because of its people. Friends meet at our cozy, fun diners. They're a place where memories are made and our employees are the absolute best. We have many that have spent years and even decades employed with us, and I believe they are the secret to our staying power. The Red Arrow Diner continues to shape its legacy due to our amazing and valued employees and customers who support us each and every day. Thank you again for this wonderful recognition of the Red Arrow Diner's place in Manchester's history and future. And I hope you'll join us at our 100th uh, anniversary celebration on October 15th. It's gonna be a great time. So hope to see you all there, thank you. Congratulations to the Red Arrow. <clears throat> so I know it has been mentioned a few times already tonight, but I would like to acknowledge uh, the many hours of work that Ed Bruder put into this program that you're about to see and all of the research that he did on tonight's honorees. I know he is disappointed, as we all are, that he could not be here tonight. I would also like to thank the following individuals who assisted Ed in his research. They are Lorette Gendron, Steve O'Connell, Dick Duckoff, Mark Mastermarino, and MHA archivist Daniel Peters. Thank you. So as you will see, the, this year's awards are geographically well distributed around the Queen City. We are going to start on the west side, where a particular home in a quiet residential neighborhood has had just three owners in its 110-year existence. 
The story begins in 1912, when a Boston and Maine locomotive engineer named Zena Sprague Foster decided to build a home at the, at, at the southeast corner of Warner and Wilkin Streets. He had married Eleanor A. Morrill in Maine 16 years earlier. They had two children, but sadly, both died in infancy. The Fosters had moved to Manchester in 1906, living at first on South Elm Street. Property records indicate that their home was built at 187 Warner Street in 1912. Researching the home proved tricky because a city directory typographical error listed it as 178 Warner Street for several years, but the owners were clearly Zena and Eleanor Foster. After Zena's death in 1929, Eleanor remained at 187 Warner Street until 1942, when she sold it, sold it to Wilbur L. and Moreg Rollins. Wilbur was a teacher at West High School. The couple raised their three children, Janet, Henry, and Catherine, in the house. Janet was the last to live there, by which time it had been owned by the Rollins family for 50 years. The house was purchased by Claudette O. and Robert B. Perot, both of whom work at nearby St. Anselm College. They were told that Wilbur Rollins, the shop teacher from West, spent years modernizing the house inside and out to fit the style of the 1950s. It was still stuck in the 50s when the Perots bought it in 1992. Commonly referred to as a New Englander style house with two stories, attic and unfinished cellar, the property includes a single car garage with attached storage shed. The Perots' goal has been to return the house to its original style or at least to something comparable. They have done some work some of the work themselves, but have also hired professionals to handle larger projects. Bob and Claudette had sole control of all planning, creative ideas, choice of materials, styles, and colors. They paid off their mortgage in just under 14 years, pursuing the renovations a bit at a time according to their finances. They undertook each phase on a pay-as-you-go basis. The exterior of the house was covered entirely with light green asbestos shingles. Windows had very narrow, plain, dark green painted wooden trim. There was a large, green, uh, large picture window in the living room that did not balance well with the two windows on the floor above. On the south side of the house, where the kitchen is, there was a small picture window. Towards the rear of the house, a side entrance mudroom had been enclosed by the previous owner, creating a tiny room with windows on the west, south, and east sides, none of which opened. The lack of windows meant there was no means of ventilation. A small cracked and crumbling concrete deck with dark green rotting wooden railings stood outside the rear entrance. The upstairs had three bedrooms. Most had plaster ceilings with cracks here and there and no ceiling molding. There was a small trap door to the attic and the hallway ceiling accessible by ladder. There was no floor in the attic, just rafters. Nearly everywhere there was horsehair plaster walls painted or covered in aging wallpaper. Doorways and windows were framed either in original early 20th century fir or painted pine molding or 1950s style plain wooden painted molding. The first floor had three arched doorways without doors or molding. The only known hardwood floors were in the living and dining rooms. All other floors were covered with aging linoleum. The bathroom had tiled walls from floor to ceiling while the kitchen had horsehair plaster walls on the top half with masonite wainscoting on the bottom. Claudette and Bob did all of the planning and designing and much of the demolition whenever possible. An early priority for them was upgrading the electrical service and installing new plumbing. They created ventilation in the kitchen and future breakfast nook by installing energy efficient vinyl windows to replace those that did not open. They selected a style of windows aesthetically compatible with the older character of their house. They purchased vintage era fur molding from Vermont Salvage to frame the new windows. They demolished the rear entrance deck and had a carpenter replace it with a wooden deck and a wooden spindled railing. Having discovered a large quantity of original fur molding removed by the previous owner, who had stored it in the attic, the Perros decided to widen the archway between two rooms transformed into a true doorway. They purchased a set of two period fur French doors from Vermont Salvage to install along with newly discovered fur molding, which they had stripped and refinished. They removed the sagging canvas ceiling in the living room, revealing a cracked plaster ceiling nine inches above, which they also removed. This in turn revealed a ceiling structure that would perhaps not have supported the master bedroom above, which they were planning to turn into a library slash in-home office filled with bookshelves and heavy furniture. These issues were gradually resolved over several years. 
a professional wallpaper hanger took care of the stairway from the living room to the upstairs hall where the drywall installer and carpenter had inadvertently discovered and removed a false stairway ceiling installed by the previous owner. The pro sanded and refinished hardwood floors in the living and dining rooms while a second carpenter removed the living room picture window and reframed the two spaces for new energy efficient windows. In 1998, the pros took advantage of a federal government funded energy savings project administered through Southern New Hampshire Services. Besides putting in a new furnace and removing asbestos heating pipe insulation and exterior siding, the project included some architecturally aesthetic improvements such as painting the clapboards, trim, and gables three colors to enhance the house's Victorian style. They installed energy saving windows that complement the house's style including antique looking molding to frame them. A new roof was installed by Adam Valancourt Roofing in 2020, and the house has just been repainted in the last few weeks. While there isn't time to list every detail of the renovation, suffice it to say that Bob and Claudette have made the restoration of their home a labor of love. Incidentally, this is not Bob Perot's first time on this stage. The published author, accomplished photographer, and French culture educator received an Historic Preservation Award for education at our 1994 gathering. The Manchester Historic Association is proud to present this homeowner's award to Robert B. and Claudette O. Perot for their home at 187 Warner Street. My wife did not want to come up here because she's kind of shy. So she said, I will go up if you speak. <laughs> but I am speechless after this program. I didn't realize we had done so much. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> I'm, I'm totally amazed. I do want to thank a few people from the Historic Association, Dick Duckoff, who visited us and said, I really like what you're doing with your house, and I like that it's on the west side, and I like that it's a modest house, because if you, I'll, mo I'll nominate you, and if you get the award, it may just encourage other people with, on the west side, with smaller houses like that that are old, to maybe restore their houses the way we did. So I wanna thank Dick for that, and I also wanna thank Jeff, and I want to thank uh, John Clayton and Ed Bruder definitely for that beautiful, and I want a copy of that <laughs> the text, <laughs> definitely, and Dan Peters as well. All of these people had a role in helping us. Thank you very much to the Historic Association and the committee that chose this award. Thank you. Congratulations. For our next award, we head to the east side. The property at 252 Willow Street, now named the Factory on Willow, has been transformed from a festering 90,000 square foot factory into a fresh and vibrant mixed use community with endless potential. The goal is to renovate the mill building by reinventing its purpose while preserving its history. Entrepreneur Liz Hitchcock and business partner Amy Chom embraced the city's master plan focused on mixed use space that would provide much needed downtown housing, commercial straight space for entrepreneurs, and community space for people to share ideas and collaborate. They also focused on a commitment of making areas more walkable and bikeable. The building dates to 1904 when it was built by the W.H. McKelwin Shoe Factory. The company was founded in 1894 and was already thriving when the Manchester plant was built. In its day, the McElwin plant was the economic center of Manchester's manufacturing industry, cranking out millions of pairs of shoes. It was unique because it was away from the Amoskeag Mill Complex along the Merrimack River. 
The company had branches in Merrimack, Nashua, Claremont, and Newport, and at one time had purported to be the largest American shoe manufacturing company. But things took a turn in January 1908 when William Howe McKelwin died at the age of 30, 41 from a pulmonary embolism. He left a wife and four children, plus a brother, J. Franklin McKelwin, who owned a competing shoe business. In subsequent years, foreign manufacturing ate into the company's market share. By the spring of 1921, McKelwin was insolvent, owning more than $15 million to local banks. Naturally, hundreds of people's employment was on the line. The assets were purchased by the International Shoe Company. But in 1925, the Federal Trade Commission ordered International to divest itself of McKelwin Properties. The building became known as the Cohas Shoe Company. Under the Works Progress Administration, a massive sewing project was established, providing employment for 1,000 local women with pay equal to men engaged in labor under the WPA. In 1936, another local shoe manufacturer, the Lewis H. Salvage Shoe Company, leased two floors, creating jobs for 1,000 people and increasing output to 5,000 pairs of high-grade ladies' shoes every single day. Salvage shoes suffered a setback in 1939 when a lacquer spraying machine caught fire in the heel department, causing $1,000 worth of damage and putting hundreds of workers temporarily out of work. Thousands of dollars worth of wooden heels were ruined by fire and water. In 1941, the state of New Hampshire announced plans to build a state trade school in Manchester. The location they picked was largely vacant brick factory building at 252 Willow Street. It opened in 1945, but the next year, the salvage company invoked a 90-day notice clause in the lease. For a time, the state considered trying to take the property by eminent domain. But here is where everything becomes strangely interconnected. The state trade school relocated to the north end in the original Webster Street School on Webster Street. It spent many years there, undergoing numerous name and location changes, until we arrive at the very building we are in tonight, Manchester Community College. Back to 252 Willow Street. From the late 1940s, it was occupied by Johnson Shoes Incorporated. By 1974, the vacant building was being shopped around by the Cohouse Realty Corporation until the day it was discovered that as much as 200,000 gallons of oil had escaped a ruptured fuel tank buried six to eight feet below the ground. That necessitated a costly and time-consuming environmental cleanup. More than 5,000 tons of petroleum-contaminated soil were eventually transported off-site for thermal treatment recycling. The factory stood empty for years until Raymond Bossineau bought it in 1979 for his company. Electropack, which was bought out and relocated in 2015. Incidentally, back in 1997, Mr. Bossano received a historic preservation award for education, not for the building itself, but for a historical exhibit he installed in it. The Hitchcock renovation began in 2019 and took two years to complete. Beyond improving the optics of Willow Street and the footprint of the site, Renovating the old factory went a long way towards mitigating the pre-existing environmental impact of the languishing building. The factory is T-shaped traditional factory brickwork with exposed beams and large windows. The original central staircase has been preserved and beautified with artwork from local artists. Liz selected certain original items to be featured in the building as a display of its history, including original wood and glass doors, cast iron boiler arch doors, and a beam that was repurposed as a bench in the lobby. She also made a large investment in replacing the windows, keeping the black sills for the integrity of the design. The factory on Willow offers a variety of freshly renovated open concept studio units, featuring original loft style finishes like rustic red brick walls, exposed oak beams, and large windows for access to an abundance of sunlight and fresh air. It offers on-site parking and green space for gardening, exercise, and relaxation. The factory's location provides access to central businesses and scenic river walk area. 
The factory has over 60 residential units and an additional 16 themed Airbnb studios that provide corporate housing to traveling nurses. Pets are welcome with a fenced in area where dogs can run free, play, and get to know their neighbors. The outdoor landscape brings the community together with a vegetable garden. Gardener Pete teaches about seedlings and composting, and residents are able to grill in the backyard and play lawn games. AIR at the factory is an international artist and residency program that pays artists to develop their body of work while living at the factory for three months. The program has hosted six artists since its beginning in July of 2021. The factory is a working place for commercial tenants. Today it hosts Loon Chocolate and 603 Charcuterie. The all-season food truck patio offers delicious meals to residents, guests, and neighbors alike. The Manchester Historic Association is pleased to present the Adaptive Reuse Award to Liz Hitchcock for the factory at 252 Willow Street. that. What a whirlwind tour of the last three years of my life. I mean, the ups, the downs, the roller coaster, it was a time, let me tell you. Um, I'm humbled tonight looking around this audience. So many friends, so many mentors, so many people I've learned so much from. Like, I just, I, I can't, there's so many amazing community leaders in this audience. It's making my heart extremely full. And I think, hopefully, I make some eye contact with some of the people that have meant so much to me over the years, so thank you. Uh, it's great to be honored alongside an amazing artist, not to jump ahead, but I love that because obviously arts and culture have been such an integral part of my life for the last 20 years. And the factory actually is really cool for many sp artists in our community. Um, I think it's really neat that there's so many artists that drove by that building. The Institute of Art, many students came down and drove by that building. Mariana and Vivian Beer came by that building thinking that it's a place where art needed to happen. So it's just a manifestation and continuation of kind of years of artists thinking about what could happen in this space. Um, I want to thank the team at the factory, Mariana, Jamie who's not with us tonight, Matt, who's not with us tonight, Carmen, who's not with us tonight, and then all of the folks at Orbit Group, our family office, who helps do all the hard stuff like finance and marketing, and our uh, chief creative director who has done much of the artwork over there. If you've seen the food truck patio or the artwork on the, uh, the floors, Dave Haiti. Um, of course, all projects don't happen without a team, and I had one of the most amazing teams in the city that was ever put together. Uh, Ekman, Market Square, uh, Fuss and O'Neill, our banking partner, Service Credit Union. I had a great leasing agent with Elm Grove and I appreciated their help and I learned so much from them. Um, it was a great home for the innovators, creators, and entrepreneurs that live there today. And finally, I want to thank uh, the Manchester Historic Association for seeing the importance in historic architecture. But more than that, the history of Manchester being so important. It's truly the foundation for where Manchester is heading today in advanced manufacturing. And if we didn't understand our history, we couldn't continue to create really amazing things like hearts and lungs. So thank you so much for all the work you do. Our next recipient tonight is a fine art photographer and photo educator who has been recognized with multiple awards, grants, and fellowships during a 50-year-plus career. We are pleased to add ours to the list tonight. Gary Sampson's relationship with the Manchester Historic Association goes back decades. Back in 1968, he got a summer job at the MHA. One of his tasks was making contact prints from the sizable glass plate negative collection which once belonged to the Amiskeg Manufacturing Company. For example, this print was made from a glass negative 
of the 1914 fire that destroyed the Merchants Exchange Building on Elm Street. What he took away from that summer experience was an appreciation of the power of photography as a tool for sharing history and culture with a wide audience. In 1969, he took on the task of documenting one of Manchester's most elegant and distinguished homes before a wrecking ball erased it from the earth. Gary fully photographed the Willows, home of former mayor and governor Frederick Smith, which was located on a 10-acre estate in what is now the rear parking lot of the Brady Sullivan Building, formerly New Hampshire Fire Insurance Company. His professional career began in 1971 at UNH, where he served as university filmmaker and manager of photography. While in Durham, he produced 10 films featuring New Hampshire's history and culture. They have aired locally, regionally, and nationally on broadcast and cable television. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, he captured images of Manchester's past, like this shot of the Lower Canal in the Emmeskig Mill Yard near Granite Street, and the city's present, like this little charmer whose image was used in Gary's latest book. He has made a record for posterity of places that are no longer there, like the Clapped Block in Granite Square. He has memorialized the faces of strangers and the faces of people we know, like fellow honoree Bob Perot. His creative output includes both still photography and videography. He has explored, curated, and utilized numerous 19th and 20th century photographic collections in the production of both films and exhibitions relating to New Hampshire's industrial past. Perhaps his best known film is A World Within a World, the Amiskeg Manufacturing Company and Milltown, a story about the Queen City's textile mills and the immigrants who operated them. This film was also turned into another book. During the 1980s, he organized and curated an exhibition on the Franco-American experience, traveling to Canada and France, as well as museums throughout New England. In 1981, he began a six-year collaboration with world-renowned portrait photographer Lottie Jacoby. After producing a film on her life, he cataloged her archive of more than 47,000 negatives, which is now housed at the Diamond Library at the University of New Hampshire in Durham. In 1984, the New Hampshire Council on the Arts awarded his second fellowship for a series of environmental portraits of Granite State artists and writers. In 1989, his work was featured in yet another book, Merrimack Valley, New Hampshire, A Visual History. His work is found in the permanent collections of the Courier Museum of Art, the New Hampshire Institute of Art, now part of New England College, the UNH Art Museum, and the National Archives in Washington. In 1980, Excuse me, in 1998, his work was included in a Courier exhibition called Moments in Time, Master Photographs. And in 1999, a port portfolio of his portraits went on display in France by special invitation from the French government. Our own state government has recognized Gary several times. In 1999, he served as the official state photographer during a program at the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival, documenting more than 140 traditional craftspeople and musicians from around the state. In 2018, Governor Sununu appointed him to a two-year term as Artist Laureate of New Hampshire. Since the 1980s, Gary has taught photography courses and workshops regionally and internationally. He has had the good fortune to travel extensively, camera equipment always by his side, documenting life in places as diverse as Quebec City, the Acropolis in Greece, Ghana, and New Orleans. He spent two months in Cape Breton photographing the people, culture, and landscape, which has resulted in the publication of several books of his work. In 2002, he was appointed chairman of the photography department at the New Hampshire Institute of Art, where he taught both digital and traditional film photography as part of a Bachelor of Fine Arts program. In May 2017, he was appointed Professor Emeritus of Photography after his retirement from the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Earlier this year, his work was featured in this beautiful hardcover book, New Hampshire Now, a photographic diary of life in the Granite State, which accompanied exhibits of photography throughout the state at museums, including the Milliard Museum. For helping us to remember where we came from and reminding us of places that are no longer and for his many contributions to our community, we are proud to confer this individual achievement award. Unfortunately, 
the recipient was unable to be here this evening. So accepting the award on Gary Sampson's behalf, please welcome MHA trustee Jen Drosiak. Good evening. I am very excited to give Gary a speech tonight because not only am I a trustee, I have known Gary since 2008 when I was a photography student of his at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. And Gary quickly became my mentor, a friend, and a colleague when he hired me for a brief stint uh, teaching at New Hampshire Institute of Art. And we both share a passion and a love for the history of this beautiful city of Manchester. So thank you. I want to begin by thanking the Manchester Historic Association for awarding me the Individual Achievement Award tonight. I regret that I cannot be here in person to accept this great honor. My love for history, especially local history, began with a summer job at the Manchester Historic Association in the summer of 1968 when I was a rising senior at Manchester Central High School. My official job was doing general maintenance including washing the floors and windows and polishing the brass handrail on the staircase leading to the second floor exhibitions and the library. It was in the library that I discovered the history of this great city born out of the Industrial Revolution through thousands of photographs and glass negatives that documented the rise and fall of the Amiskeag Manufacturing Company and the people whose lives were transformed by the company's successes and failures. The significance and impact of these photographs stayed with me and a few years later, while I was at the University of New Hampshire, I made a 30-minute documentary film about the Amiskeg Manufacturing Company based on the MHA photographic collection. I found that photography could be a powerful tool of communication in helping people to better understand their past, our legacy and our culture that is so important to preserve and build upon in the future. That film was the start of my career exploring New Hampshire history and its people that continues to this day with my current projects. Again, I want to thank Manchester Historic Association for this great honor. Thank you. All right, congratulations to Gary. Our next award is also on the east side, but is almost in Auburn. As you probably know, Manchester Waterworks is responsible for, for providing drinking water and fire protection to the city of Manchester, as well as portions of Auburn, Bedford, Derry, Goffstown, Hooksett, and Londonderry. It has been fulfilling this mission since 1871. So what are we talking about when we discuss stewardship? It generally refers to the careful and responsible management of something entrusted to one's care, as in stewardship of natural resources like water. The subject of this award is located at the High Service Pumping Station and Water Treatment Plant at 1583 Lakeshore Road on the shores of Lake Massabesic. The White House was built in 1895 as the residence for the operator of the High Service Pumping Station, which pumped drinking water from Lake Massabesic up to the Oak Hill Reservoir by Dairyfield Park and Weston Tower. Adjacent to the Victorian-style house were several barns where the operator and his family raised and grew their own food. The first family to live here was Ben McDonald, his wife, and his four children. All four of the children eventually had careers working for Manchester Waterworks up until 1980 when the youngest child, Woody, retired from the watershed crew. Following the McDonalds were the families of Clarence Algren, Robert Beauvrevage, and Gary Carolian. In 2019, Gary retired from the waterworks, leaving the property vacant and in need of serious repair. At this point, Jason Iantile and Dana Phillip, both waterworks watershed patrol officers, agreed to attempt to renovate the building. This included repairing or replacing all ceilings throughout the house, repairing or replacing all of the walls, repairing and upgrading the kitchen area, painting or polyurethaning all the ceilings, walls, and trim, and also building several pieces of custom furniture in keeping with the period of the home. Jason and Dana also repaired and replaced both porches and repaired and painted the entire building exterior. The original windows were removed years ago, so they replaced all the windows with new ones that replicate the original split frame 
with flat black exterior that appeared in photos from the turn of the 20th century. A contractor was brought in to rewire the electrical system and remove any leftover knob and tube wiring to ensure against possible fires. The result was like having a brand new building. The care and attention to detail was performed well outside of Jason and Dana's normal areas of responsibility. The building currently is occupied by the Watershed Division and more specifically the Offices of Land and Property Manager, Watershed Forester, and Watershed Patrol Officer Staff. This isn't the first time the Manchester Historic Association has recognized Manchester Waterworks. In 2015, we awarded them a Conservation of Natural and Structural Resources Award for maintaining the city water supply in stewardship of Massabesic Watershed. It would have been easy to demolish this old farmhouse and build a modern office building, but Waterworks found a way to preserve and reuse a structure that has served multiple purposes for 127 years. That's what we mean by stewardship. The MHA presents the Stewardship Award to Manchester Waterworks for the operator's residence at 1583 Lakeshore Road. Accepting the award is the Director of Waterworks, Philip Crosdale. I'll be very brief. I know. I'll be very brief. I know we have people have a lot to do tonight. Uh, first night of football. Sound familiar? Um, yeah. Most of it was mentioned in that uh, presentation. It was very good. And uh, I just want to say, I'd like to thank uh, Colleen Kalinsky, the president. Sorry, Ed, Ed Brugge is not here tonight. I met. I actually met Ed out when he was taking pictures of the house. I house, I happened to be out there that, that day and we had a nice discussion, very nice gentleman. I'm sorry he couldn't be here tonight. Um, and thank the nominating committee for this, this great honor. And again, it's the second time we've been here in seven years. We do have a lot of historical buildings with the Manchester Waterworks, we're 150 years old. And I hope hopefully within the next several years we'll be back with a few more. Originally, originally, the building was called the Dwelling House. And as was said, I'd just like to make it one correction. The building was actually constructed in 1893. Uh, it was done in conjunction with the high service station, which if you look at that picture right there, the high service station would be to the right of the building, right on Lake Massabesic. And just to give you a little bit of history as to why that, that uh, farmhouse was constructed, in 1871, Manchester had a population of about 22,000 people. And that's when the Manchester Waterworks was started. And they built a, a water system from the Cohas pump station, pumping up to what was then Manchester Center on Mammoth Road. You can see the two tanks up there now between Island Pond and Cohas. And the water was gravity fed down to basically what was Manchester. Uh, um, at that time, pretty much areas south of Ashland Street, west of Valley Street, and at that time, just south of Webster Street. Over the next 25 years, or 22 years, in 1890, the population doubled, and that's primarily due to, as we know, the Amoskeg Mills and the explosion of, of those businesses down in that area. So in as, soon, as, as early as 1873, they were already thinking about how they were going to serve water to the higher elevations. The current water system only allowed them to serve to a certain level because, again, it was gravity fed by pressure. So they were looking at different options. And by 1893, they developed, they decided that they were going to build a high service station, pump station on Lake Massabesic and pump up into 
what is, what is Oak Hill, which is in Derryfield Park, and pump to a four million gallon reservoir top of Oak Hill. And that's situated where you can see the two cell towers now. And to this day, the four million gallon reservoir is still servicing the city of Manchester. The high service station was built with three steam pumps powered by coal. Therefore, they needed people to, to actually live out at the site because it was several miles from, from Manchester. So they needed people to live there and work the pump station. The engineer, supervisor, lived in the, dwe lived in the dwelling house. And there was a second house that the waterworks had purchased from the Hunter family. There was a family a hunter that owned a farm adjacent to this property. They purchased that house, and another operator lived in that house. I just want to mention very instrumental in developing the high system was a person by the name of, and sounds familiar, James A. Weston. He was a former mayor of Manchester in the 1860s, 70s, and 75. He was a former governor of New Hampshire, and he was a water commissioner from 1875 to 1895. At that time, James Weston bequeathed $5,000 for the Weston Observatory at the summit of Oak Hill, which stands there today. And that observatory was dedicated in September 6, 1897. So if you do the math, this month it's 125 years old. So again, I'd just like to uh, thank the Manchester, House, uh, Man not House, Manchester Historic Association, <laughs> excuse me, for this distinct honor. And I'd like to introduce John O'Neill, a watershed property manager, say a few words. He was the person with the vision that I credit with convincing me at the time that the building was salvageable and shouldn't be raised and replaced with something new. In 2019, the building was in very sad shape. It didn't look like really it could be inhabited again or used for any other purpose. But John, John, we took a tour and John convinced me that the building could be saved and to be repurposed for what it is today which is our watershed division and the offices for John and his crews. John? Thank you, Phil. Uh, good evening, and uh, it's a great honor to be here tonight. Thank you for, to the uh, Manchester Historical Association for presenting us with this award. Um, you know, we're honored, uh, the staff uh, is honored at, at Manchester Waterworks to receive this award. Um, in September 2020, our chief operator moved out of the, and his family moved out of the White House after living there about 14 years. And after walking through the mostly empty farmhouse, uh, Jason Iantiel and Dana Phillip, uh, our watershed patrolman staff, uh, thought the place showed uh, promise for the newly created watershed division headquarters and offered to clean it and give it a paint job. Uh, little did they really know what they were, <laughs> they were getting into. Um, I, as Phil mentioned, I spoke to Phil um, about it um, to give about their ideas, and uh, he gave us his blessing to give it a try. Um, it didn't seem too promising at the time. Uh, many, many thanks to Phil for for also seeing that vision. Um, you know, the uh, I think a few people we had a little bit of termites in the basement, and some of our folks there said the place is junk. You know, it's it's just going to fall down. You know, and uh, and and it looked pretty rough. Um, so. Um, Jason and Dana began giving the place a thorough cleaning from attic to basement, um, and over the next four months while working around their, their regular duties, uh, as they got into what we call kind of the off season when summertime uh, slows down, we get into the fall where our duties change, uh, uh, they completed the long list that you saw. Um, I actually listed them here. I, I, Ed did a great job. You know, thank you to Ed Bruder for his great presentation that he did um, for us um, on our behalf. Um, they ended up uh, completing this, you know, really this was something that was done, you know, in they fit in the time to do it. So they actually had to still continue with all their regular duties and then squeeze in time to do this. And then they grabbed other watershed patrol staff to help them along. And so our whole watershed patrol staff played a part in some of the, the duties that these guys performed. But it was dirty work, it was hard work. Um, it took dedication on their behalf to detail, to, um, you know, really to take their time, but also to move along quickly because there were, this was kind of a, a side job within a regular job. So they, uh, 
they really made it work because their regular duties did not lapse. Uh, I'm very proud of Jason and Dana for their willingness to and attention to detail in carrying out a full-scale renovation of this historic building while still performing their regular duties. Um, I'd like for Jason and Dana to stand up. Uh, they're like your wife, they're a couple shy people. So please, everybody, a big round of applause for these guys. Um, without their efforts, I, you know, I know we wouldn't be here today. Um, I also wanted to uh, just thank Phil for the, uh, the much needed encouragement and uh, budgetary support for completing this project. Um, you know, we did do, have to do an electrical system upgrade. Uh, Granite State Electric, who had experience wiring uh, some places for the Courier Museum, came in and they worked diligently in there uh, to not to disturb the structure or, you know, some of the walls and, and things like that. So they, they worked really hard, really dirty work, really tough work, and we're really grateful for them for the work they did. Um, and Phil also encouraged us to relocate the millstone from the mill pond uh, down at the corner of Island Pond and uh, Lakeshore Road, which you see in the front here, and we made it our sign. So we brought that up as another little piece of history. So, you know, uh, Phil, Phil is, uh, you know, as much part of this vision, uh, you know, as Jason and Dana and I were. We, this, this was a group effort, you know, and I just, uh, um, this was, uh, you know, it's an honor to accept this award. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful place to have our office. Uh, get a view of the lake right from the windows there. Um, but it's just great to be included amongst all these other great projects that are getting presented today. So just a, a heartfelt thank you from the Manchester Waterworks staff. So thank you. Congratulations again to Manchester Waterworks. For our final award this evening, we head to the north end of Manchester Although the story begins on November 26, 1869 in Point St. Peter in the province of Quebec with the birth of Edwin Hamlin Legressley. He left the Gaspé Peninsula to get an education on the Channel Islands between France and England. Then he came to Manchester in the mid-1890s and became associated with the furniture store of his mother's brother, Charles de Moulipay. Over time, he shortened his name to Edwin Lee Gressley, and he quickly made his mark in home furnishings, buying out his uncle by 1905. Edwin caught the eye of a local lady. In July 1903, he married Catherine Amelia Woodley, and they took up residence in this house at 497 Hanover Street, right near the crest of the hill. They raised three children there, and over the course of the next 26 years, Edwin could stare directly across the street at this building. This was one of a pair of stately Victorian apartment buildings on the north side of Hanover Street, named for the streets that bounded them. The Milton was numbered 496 to 498 Hanover, while the Belmont was numbered 488 to 490. The two are believed to have been built as early as 1898, but it isn't entirely clear who built them. It is clear, though, that in September 1913, Edwin Gressley bought the entire block on which the Milton and Belmont apartments stood. Just to show you again how interconnected everything is, this very organization recognized the Milton and Belmont Apartments with a private development award during the very first Historic Preservation Awards ceremony 30 years ago in 1993. At any rate, being a neighbor, then owner of those luxurious apartment buildings could well have sparked Gressley's next venture, the building at 669 Chestnut Street that we recognize tonight. The massive block-long Victorian structure bounded by Sagamore and Penacook Streets, was built in 1911 after Gressley purchased the land from local painting contractor Herman Maynard. Noted for its architectural grandeur, the complex was known then as the Gressley Apartments. Ironically, Edwin just owned it. He never lived in it. In fact, Edwin's time in Manchester was short. With a knack for good timing, he and Catherine moved the kids to Los Angeles selling both their Hanover Street properties and the Chestnut Street apartment house just before the horrible stock market crash of 1929. There he stayed until his death in September 1943 at the age of 74. Over the years, the Gressley residents changed hands multiple times and its reputation rose and fell as rental units tend to do. Many tenants came and went, but the distinctive appearance of the massive structure caught the eyes of many Queen City residents. Note this rare newspaper photo showing Chestnut Street with two-way traffic. This photo accompanied a four-page union leader spread on February 11, 1936.
The building had just changed hands, and the new owners launched a major remodeling. They subdivided the existing apartments, reducing four to six room units into convenient two room units. Altogether, there were 39 apartments, and the rate of occupancy was 95%. Each featured modern gas cookery and Electrolux refrigeration. In July 2015, Ron and Jenny Menning of North Sutton purchased the sprawling Chestnut Street property. They embarked on numerous interior, exterior, and infrastructure improvements, enlisting the expertise of several New Hampshire craftsmen. This required an extensive investment of time and money and a strong commitment to preserving the building's original architectural details. There are 15 elaborate opalescent stained glass exterior and interior doors at the Gressley residence. In various states of disrepair and damage, some were nearly irrecoverable. Harvey Best's Antique Furniture Repair and Restoration in Andover, New Hampshire, took on the project of repairing, replacing glass, and refinishing these doors. The stunning stained glass doors continue to highlight the magnificent front entrance that is framed by stalwart Corinthian columns. A new sign in the front of the building draws attention to the grand entrance and replicates the intricate design features visible on the building's columns, brackets, and cornices. Ornamental trees grace the front yard, and the Gressley's backyard is now a spacious garden patio. Kitchens and bathrooms were refreshed with new fixtures, appliances, and granite countertops. Lighting, plumbing, wall repair, and painting were all addressed. Restoration of the original hardwood flooring required removal of multiple layers of old flooring. It was like opening a time capsule to see the changes that were made through the decades. The Gressley residence is graced with several impressive balustrades. There are 260 large wood balusters, many of which needed to be replaced due to age and deterioration. The Mennings engaged Jeff Roberts of J.S. Roberts Furniture Maker and Carver of Unity, New Hampshire to craft custom, turned, and exact dimensional replacement cedar balusters. Full exterior painting highlighted the vintage siding, fascia, columns, and cornices. Deterioration and modern safety codes dictated replacement of the rear decks. Complete removal and replacement of multi-floor decks, stairs, and railings was done to enhance the structure and appearance of the building. The Mennings have made significant investments in the infrastructure, including repaving the parking lot, full insulation and weatherization, interior electrical upgrades, HVAC repairs, new basement bulkheads, garage roof replacement, and exterior lighting. The eighth annual MHA Historic Preservation Awards in 2000 featured a People's Choice component, which allowed citizens to nominate their favorite buildings. The Gressley residents won, outpolling 35 other entries. Tonight, we are pleased to present this restoration of a city landmark award to the Gressley residents at 669 Chestnut Street. Owners. Owners Jenny and Ron Menning are away, but their son and daughter-in-law, Matt and Marilyn Menning, are here to accept the award. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it, and I appreciate the honor that the Manchester Historic Association has bestowed on this building and on our small part that we've played in its history so far. Um, so when I was growing up, my family moved twice, both times into very old homes, uh, fixer-uppers would put it lightly. Uh, when I was in middle school is when we moved to our 200-year-old home in Sutton, New Hampshire. And I still have clear memories of picking up wheelbarrows full of old shingles and nails from the yard, carrying bucket after bucket of dirt and rocks as we dug out the basement, and living for months in small sections of the house, which were cordoned off by plastic sheets, trying their best to keep the dust out. I also remember at that time swearing to my parents that I would never, never live in an old house. I wanted new, I wanted clean, I didn't want any more of that. But as it often turns out, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. So our family purchased the Gressley in 2015, and though we didn't immediately realize its full potential, we quickly got to work on updates and restorations. And over the next about five or six years, three of which my wife and I lived at the property, I learned the joys and frustrations of steam heat, the 
delight of uncovering maple floors under five layers of Luon and linoleum and how to get creative with cabinet layouts. We were very fortunate to work with many skilled contractors and craftsmen. Um, it would not have been possible. I don't want to make an impression that, that I, I myself did this work. It, I, I helped in many ways, but uh, there was a lot of people involved with this restoration. I very much appreciate that. They each left their own mark on the property. You can highlight a few tonight. Um, I also am not sure if Jim is here tonight, but I did want to thank a longtime resident of the Gressley, Jim Nielsen, for encouraging us to submit this award. I believe Jim has lived there for almost 30 years, and uh, he, he's a fixture in, in the community as much as the building is, so I appreciate that, Jim. Uh, the experience of blending old with the new, sticking to budgets, or sometimes blowing through them, contending with the seemingly unending problems are at the same time maddening and supremely rewarding. There's nothing quite like the tangible satisfaction of restoring a historic property. There's a sense of respect for the craftsmanship, the blood, sweat, and tears of prior generations, while also the pride of creating new beauty born in your own mind's eye. The Gressley turned 110 recently, and as anyone knows who owns an old home, the projects are never truly finished. I look forward to continuing the stewardship of this historic Manchester landmark for many years to come, and thank you again for the honor. Congratulations again to all of tonight's honorees, and thank you to everyone for coming this evening and supporting the Manchester Historic Association. Before we conclude, a reminder for anyone who pledged support tonight, if you would like to check out with your star, Dan and Christy are happy to assist you at the registration table in the foyer. You may also use your smartphone and scan the QR code on the back of your star. And thank you to everyone who bid on tonight's special silent auction items that we had out in the foyer. And I have the winners to announce. So the following individuals have won, and they can also check out at the registration. So to start with, we have our Milliard Museum membership and gift bag, and that goes to Ben Horton. <laughs> and then from, for the three collages of historic Manchester photographs, the, the first large collage goes to Richard Dreyer. Thank you, Richard. And the second one goes to Peter Hastings. Congratulations, Peter. And the small collage number two also goes to Richard Dreyer. So congratulations to all of you, and thank you for bidding on those items. Finally, an announcement about the 2023 Historic Preservation Awards. After the pandemic forced this event into a September time slot, the past couple years, we are planning a return to normalcy and moving the Preservation Awards back to spring, likely in late May. So to that end, nominations are now open for the 2023 awards. If you have a person, business, or project that you think is deserving, please submit a nomination to the Manchester Historic Association by December 3rd. Nomination forms and other information is available on our website. And now everyone is invited to stay and enjoy some dessert and coffee. Thank you again. Have a great evening, everyone.